If anyone is joining late, please help them out with the page numbers. Diet in cancer, it's chapter 21, page number 475. So diet in cancer, oncogenes. The so oncogenes are mutation causing genes, okay, or the genes which were normal, but because of any other environmental mutations, they became cancer causing genes. Okay, so from the Im image you can see here, any ca cancer causing agents. We all we got them we call them carcinogens. Okay, cancer causing agents we call them as carcinogens. I'll put it in the chat box. Carcinogens are any any agents. Okay, it could be chemical, physical, radiation. Okay, pollution, any agents that uh, virus as well. Okay, human papilloma virus, HPV virus is a cancer causing virus. Okay. So these are carcinogens, carcinogenic in nature. These cancer-causing agents can go at your DNA level, okay? And they can install one proto-oncogene uh, or the changes or the mutation that they cause on the proto-oncogene. Through that, your entire DNA becomes an activated oncogene. Oncogene means cancer-causing genes. And now the normal cell in which this mutation has took place the normal dna with the uh, with the act, uh, activation of oncogene now it has become a cancer causing dna it turns the entire normal cell into a cancerous cell and this spreads okay and this cancer causing cell when it multiplies and divides it divides into more and more cancer causing cell a normal cell will divide and multiply into normal cell a cancer cause cancer cell, cancerous cell will divide and multiply into more cancer causing cell. Okay. So this is how oncogenes work. Is it clear to all? So cancer is caused by any mutation or abnormal activation of cellular genes, which is normal by nature. Cellular genes are normal in nature and they control the cell growth and cell mitosis the way how cells divide and multiply. But as soon as some mutation has took place in the DNA level of our normal cell, they become cancerous cell. And when they again undergo cell division and mitosis, they bring more cancer cells into action. Okay, So this is how cancer happens in a human body. These abnormal genes are called oncogenes. And we also have a lot of suppressor genes, regulator genes, cancer prevention genes within our body, which are already always on high alert. Uh, and these are on duty to make sure that oncogenes do not stabilize, do not take place, okay? Oncogenes do not happen in your normal cell, okay? So depending on the vocation, cancer has its classification in our Wednesday class last Class, if you remember, we have discussed this in detail. Carcinoma means the cancer of the epithelial cells like skin, mouth, throat, breast, lungs. There are various types of epithelial cells, okay? Squamous epithelial cells, columnar epithelial cells, okay? Uh, uh, transitional epithelial cells. There are different types of epithelial cells found around your body, okay? Within your body, around your body, okay? So when cancer happens at the epithelial cells, we call it carcinoma. Okay, and when the cancer, if it is a cancer of bone, muscle, connective tissue, we call it sarcoma. Okay, any connective tissue in general, we call it sarcoma. And if it is the cancer of the blood forming organs like bone marrow, 
spleen. Okay, we call it leukemia. Okay, and cancer of the infection fighting organs is called as lymphoma. Okay, in the lymphatic system, in, if it happens in the lymph nodes, lymph vessels, okay, we call it lymphoma. Okay, coming to the risk factors of cancer, first is heredity. Okay. Heredity, in many families, there is a strong heredity tendency for cancer. Okay, Cancer runs in families as well. Specifically, breast cancer, cervical cancer. Okay, First, female relatives are always at the higher risk, like mother, daughter, sisters, grandpa, grandmothers. Okay, That is the, the first female generation, first female uh, relatives. The nearby female relatives are always at the risk of getting breast cancer. If anyone in your family, mothers or your mother, grandmother, your aunt, anyone has suffered from breast cancer, there are high chances that other females related by blood, okay, they also have the same risk of developing breast cancer or cervical cancers, okay. Breast cancer, ovarian cancer, colon cancers as well, okay, they run in family. Then we have environmental factors like ionizing radiation, Environmental factors, uh, in detail, we will discuss about that. Ionizing radiations like X-rays, gamma rays, particle radiation. Those who work in radiology department, okay, they are at risk of developing cancers because of radiation. If they do not wear lead protective it's, uh, personal equipment which are made up of lead. Okay, if you are working in a radiology department, you have to wear red lead apron because lead can... Uh, repel back the radiation. Lead will not allow the radiation to pass through. Okay. Then chemical substances like benzene, asbestos, tobacco, okay, they also cause cancer. Dietary factors. Certain food can interact with uh, food interaction can also lead to cancer. For example, meat Red meat, specifically red meat. Okay, meat intake has been positively associated with the risk of digestive tract cancer, breast cancer, renal carcinoma. Okay, intake of red meat like beef, lamb, pork, any processed meat as well like ham, salam, bacon. So the uh, these are this is how meat is related to cancer. Then energy balance, body weight, body mass index. In various epidemiological studies, we have seen that um, there is a positive association with people who suffer from breast cancer, endometrial cancer, that is uterine cancer, gallbladder, and being uh, obese or overweight. Okay, so there is a positive association there. With the increase in weight gain in females, there are an increased risk of breast cancer. Okay, specifically in postmenopausal women after menopause. Okay, not before menopause, after menopause. Then insulin resistance, PCOD. In all majority of the women who suffer from PCODs, we have seen insulin resistance. So if you suffer from insulin resistance in the long run, there has been an association of colon cancer, breast cancer, and prostate cancer with insulin resistance. Then other, uh, other dietary factors like sugars, too much consumption of simple sugars, fat, saturated fat, diets high in animal fat, and omega-6 fatty acid intake can also increase too much in, in more than normal intake of omega-6 fatty acid can lead to colorectal cancer, breast cancer. Protein, increased meat intake has been found to be associated with increased risk of colon cancer, vitamins, minerals, Low blood clotting levels, those who are those who are having deficiency in vitamin A, that is low blood clotting levels means they are deficient in vitamin A. Okay, there is an association with that low, uh, deficiency of vitamin A and lung cancer. Also, low dietary intake of vitamin C and associate positive association with oropharyngeal cancer, stomach cancer, esophageal cancer, 
if vitamin e is low in your diet okay lung cancer cervix, cervical cancer this is risk it, it does not does not mean that if you're deficient in these vitamins you will definitely get it the risk factor increases that's it you should have a family history as well of these types of cancer homocysteine level uh, which increases due to folate def deficiency that would also increase the risk of colon cancers zinc deficiency selenium deficiency these are micro minerals okay that can also increase the risk of cancer Then alcohol, alcoholism can lead to the cancer of liver, liver cirrhosis, and that, then that will lead to cancer. Especially beer consumption has been uh, has been associated with an increased risk of colorectal cancer. Then nitrates, nitrates are present in a variety of food. Okay, sodium nitrates, potassium nitrates are present in processed food. Too much of salt usage, too much of pickled items that you use in your food, like hot dogs. Okay, and to get that specific color, uh, color agents, preservatives, okay, these will also lead to cancer of the digestive tract. Then, aflatoxin, it's a fungi that grows on cereals and groundnuts that can also lead to liver cancer. Beta carotene supplements, when lung cancer patients are supplemented with beta carotene, the severity of the disease will increase. Okay, there is a beta carotene, low deficient, low beta carotene and lung cancer association is already there. But on top of that, when you give beta carotene supplements to lung cancer patient, the severity of the disease increases. Okay, so this is one research statement, an individual research statement. Estrogens, specifically, uh, estrogen have been extensive relief for as a hormonal replacement, uh, replacement therapy. Because as soon as a woman approaches her menstrual or uh, her menopause, okay, she will be put on hormonal replacement therapy, okay, in which the estrogen is a major hormone that is given, okay, for the prevention of osteoporosis. But there is always an uncertainty. You are giving some, giving a hormone, you are injecting a synthetic hormone uh, into a postmenopausal woman, okay, and estrogen on a monthly basis every woman for this is true for every woman okay the presence of estrogen on a monthly basis is already changing your uh, the uh, the anatomy of your breast on a monthly basis okay women must know this okay as soon as your uh, the menstruation approaches the, the breast gets swollen tender okay heavier okay it get, it uh, gets a lot sen uh, it will get a lot sensitive okay the other uh, when the periods are over and or as soon as you start your period and the periods are get, uh, over your breast come back to its normal form okay so what's happening on a monthly basis estrogens are triggering your breast at the cellular level okay and what happens when you make synthetic estrogen to do the same impact or cause the same impact in your body even when you are in a post menopausal age or at a menopausal age this 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 becomes a, an unhealthy way of putting a woman's body through artificial uh, hormones and creating an artificial environment for breast cells to react and that leads to risk of breast cancer so this is why estrogens specifically the estrogens used in hormonal replacement therapy therapy leads to breast cancer okay it it has it will increase the risk of breast cancer not leads to Then viruses as well, human papilloma virus and Epstein-Barr virus, these are considered oncogenic. Vaccines are available for the prevention of cervical cancer, which are still under trial. Okay. Stress can also damage your thymus gland. It can damage your immune system and that could also lead to hormonal effects. Then metabolic syndrome 
when you uh, like it is associated with metabolic stress syndrome any any metabolic imbalances okay prolonged constipation prolonged di diarrhea okay, these will also increase your higher risk of colorectal pancreatic cancers in males and breast cancers in females any metabolic syndromes estrogen when hormonal replacement therapy is started for postmenopausal and menopausal women okay there are high chances that hormonal replacement therapy can trigger breast cancer okay not the estrogen that the body makes estrogen on a monthly basis is already making changes in your body okay that's the reason why breast cancer is increasing among women okay consumption over consumption of oral contraceptive pills and the increase in breast cancer rates have increased okay why synthetic estrogens are doing something to the human female bodies that is in a way unhealthy or unnatural okay so that is the reason why estrogens are also a causative agent taking synthetic estrogen okay Horm hormonal replacement therapy or estrogen or synthetic estrogen could be a risk factor for breast cancer in females. Then age, after the age of 65, okay, the incidence of colorectal cancer is higher. As you age after midlife, okay, your risk of getting cancers are higher because you have accumulated a lot of genetic mutation over time and that will start to show up in the body. Then physical activity, men, women whose lifestyles include regular vigorous physical activity have the lowest risk of colon cancer as compared to those who do not do any physical activity. And it may also, it's not sure, not concluded, it may uh, reduce the risk, physical activity may reduce the risk of breast cancer as well. Any estrogen supplements, not just plant-based or synthetic, any estrogen supplements, what estrogen essentially does in your body, even the estrogen that your own body makes, okay, that the woman's own body makes is going to do the same thing in your body. It's going to change the cellular structure of the cells on a monthly basis during menstruation, okay. During an entire menstruation cycle, a woman's body changes a lot throughout the month. Okay, it changes, uh, it puts on weight, it, it sheds the weight, again it puts on weight, it sheds the weight, it goes on, on, on a monthly basis all throughout of the year. Okay, and sometimes these changes, these continuous changes in the anatomy of the female body can also trigger mutation. Okay, uh, that's why that leads to breast cancer. Physical activity is not the risk, physical activity reduces the risk. Then immune factors. Healthy immune system can recognize foreign cells and destroy them in the first stage itself. It does not allow them to wait and do any genetic mutation. But if your inner immune system is not working properly, your, your tumor cells can, can still form because your immun immunity is not able to identify a foreign, foreign agent and an unchecked growth of tumor cells will keep happening and that leads to cancer. So these are the risk factors. Painkillers that you take to relieve the pain of menstruation is not a risk factor because whatever painkiller you're taking, you're not taking it throughout the month. Okay, you're taking it just for that one day to get that relief. Okay, hardly one painkiller in majority of the cases one pain killer, killer on the first day or the second day, whichever day you are feeling extremely uh, tired and you, you are feeling extremely uncomfortable, you just take one painkiller, okay? How it could be uh, diclofenac, okay? Or methylspasm, any anti-spasmodic uh, painkiller or any analgesic, okay? You're just taking one tablet. You're, and majority of the women in India, majority of the women, they don't drink smoke, okay? Only a, a very small fraction of women drink and smoke, specifically in uh, urban countries. So, in majority of the in women, majority of them they have a very healthy liver. 
okay, which can definitely take care of this painkiller. It is nothing for the liver to, uh, to detoxify the effects of painkillers. So there is no compulsion that you should not take painkillers when you are menstruating. It's not like that. Okay, if it is affecting, if your menstruation is affecting your physical uh, activities, okay, if it is affecting your work, if it, if it is uh, not uh, allowing you to take rest properly, take painkillers. There is no wrong, that there is nothing wrong in that. Okay, specifically, if you are not drinking, you are not smoking, your liver is healthy, your liver can take care of the painkillers. You don't have to worry about it. Okay? It's just one single painkiller. Okay. Environmental factors of ionizing radiation chemical substances, viruses, stress, we have discussed. Dietary factors also, meat, energy balance, sugar, fat, protein, vitamins, alcohols, nitrates, aflatoxin, beta supplement, all these parts we have discussed. So caution, this is a mnemonic that you can use. So, uh, caution C stands for a change in your bowel or bad bladder habits. Okay, that's a common sign of colorectal cancer, which means everyone has a routine. Okay, by this time, you empty your bladder, empty your bowel. Okay, number one, number two is done for the day. You have a routine. But when this routine changes, okay, that is a common sign for colorectal cancer. Then A stands for a sore that does not heal, a wound that does not heal. Specifically, if it is located in the in on the skin, mouth, okay, that could be a sign of skin cancer or oral cancer. Okay. Then U stands for unusual bleeding or discharges. Any bleeding from the bladder, vagina, rectum could be in prostate, cervical, or colorectal cancer. Okay. And this bleeding and discharge could be without any pain. Okay, there is no pain associated, there is no bruising or cuts associated, okay? No pain, but there is bleeding. That would also uh, a, a sign for prostate, cervical, or colorectal cancer. Then T stands for thickening or lump in the breast or elsewhere, okay? That breast self-examination is taught to women. You can check YouTube as well or Google it. Uh, you will see the posters on how to do the breast self-examination, okay? If you feel a lump or any thick thickness in one part of the breast, the other part is not there. Okay, that could be a sign of breast cancer. In in men, um, this lump could be a testicle a testicular cancer as well. Then I stands for indigestion or dysphagia, not able to swallow. Dysphagia means not able to swallow, difficulty in swallowing. So that could be a symptom of stomach, throat, esophageal, or mouth cancer. Then O stands for obvious change in a wart or mold. Specifically, obvious change means specifically the outer border of a wart or a mold that you already had. Okay, since long you had a mold or a wart on your body, and the outer border, outer border of this wart or mold is changing uh, in its size, in its appearance. Okay. So that could be another cause of symptom of uh, skin cancer. Then N stands for nagging cough or hoarseness in the voice. A cough that lasts for more than four weeks. It's not getting cured. That could be a symptom of lung cancer, throat cancer or hoarseness in the voice. Very rough voice. The voice has changed. First it was smooth. The opposite of hoarse is smooth. And you don't have a smooth voice. You have a very rough breaking voice. Okay, that is hoarseness. That could be a sign of throat cancer. Okay. So this is a mnemonic you can remember. You can take a screenshot of it as well for future reference.
general system reactions, abnormalities in metabolism, either you will have extreme weight loss, okay, and weakness, not able to metabolize carbohydrates, okay, and your body will use its own tissue protein, own, uh, it will under, it will be in a catabolism state, okay, your body will use its own fuel, okay, own stored fuel, fat, protein, carbohydrates for survival. Many patients can reduce, uh, can develop insulin resistance as well. Glucose tolerance, intolerance occurs in patients. They are not able to digest carbohydrates. They vomit. They feel nauseated when they eat for carbohydrates. And when the uh, when the tumors keep on growing, okay, whatever protein you are giving to your patient, okay, the tumor will use this pro protein. It will tumor will act as a parasite. Okay, tumor or cancer will act as a parasite and it will use up the protein that actually the host, the patient requires to recover. Okay, so these are the abnormalities of metabolism that we see. Anorexia, we have seen that it is, it is accompanied with depression as well. It is physical as well as mental. The anorexia means not do not having the appetite to eat anything. They will not avoid food. They will not eat anything. This has of both factors, physical factors as well as mental factors. Okay, either the patient is undergoing depression or stress related uh, related to the disease condition, or the patient is undergoing some physical inability like dysphagia, sore throat, indigestion. Okay, chronic diarrhea, or they may be put on any naso uh, NG tube feeding, or they are undergoing chemotherapy and radiation therapy because of which they are always vomiting. So they don't feel like eating. So this is how anorexia happens. Wasting, as I mentioned, the protein and whatever food you give to your patient, the tumor and the cancer acts like a parasite and it will steal all this protein and carbohydrates for its own use, for growth, to, uh, to grow in size as compared to give the patient nutrition. So that's how muscle wasting, body fat, fat wasting takes place in the patient. Then malabsorption, it will uh, like the bubble bubble and bladder movements are bad okay the either the patient will suffer from a lot of diarrhea constipation okay a uh, lot of steatotoria as well fat is not absorbed and all these factors will lead to various deficiency okay first of all the intestine is not able to absorb nutrient and the patient is already going through deficiency Okay, so you try to put more nutritious food, but it will again pass through the body as it is. It will not be absorbed. So it creates this vicious loop. Okay, the patient stays deficient and the patient has to undergo uh, suffer from malabsorption as well. Okay. Fluid electrolyte imbalances like uh, continuous vomiting and diarrhea not only really bring the water loss, but they will also lead to the loss of minerals and electrolytes and water-soluble vitamins. Uh, through urine and diarrhea as well. Anemia. A lot of factors has to contribute when a patient has to develop anemia. Usually when the patient is deficient in iron, protein, folic acid, vitamin B12, vitamin C, okay, if these things are not being absorbed by the intestine, automatically the body goes into a state of anemia. Okay, And also, if it is a bleeding tumor, if it is a bleeding cancer or a bleeding tumor, a lot of blood loss is also happening. Okay, that also contributes to anemia. Then taste and appetite changes as a side effect for medication, chemotherapy, radiation therapy. Okay. Specifically, if the patient is undergoing chemo chemotherapy of head, neck radiation, that would lead to taste blindness, inability to distinguish between different tastes like salt, sweet, sour. And again, it leads to a lot of food aversions, specifically if the patient had eaten a specific kind of food before he or she went into chemotherapy. And after the session, the patient is vomiting a lot. Okay. Uh, and uh, automatically, the patient will create a aversion regard towards that particular food. Okay.
Then we have uh, learned food aversions. This is the role of appetite after having a fear and uncertainty of the diagnosis. Automatically, the patient will start to have a lot of food aversions, avoid certain type of food that leads to a lot of vomiting. Okay. Uh, so st stress can also play an imp uh, important role here to lead the patient towards food aversion. Okay. Slowly, a lot of food they will try to avoid from their diet. Specifically, if they're if the body is reacting in an unpleasant way towards a specific food after chemotherapy or after uh, radiation therapy, the patient will uh, stop using that specific kind of food. Hypercalcemia. Too much of too much of uh, calcium uh, in the blood. That is what we call as hypercalcemia. It is usually a metabolic complication that cancer patients suffer from. Approximately 20 to 40 percent of the patients who suffer from breast cancer or bladder cancer, renal cancer, they develop hypercalcemia because the kidneys are not able to filter out excess calcium out of the blood. Okay. Then osteomalacia, opposite of hyper, uh, like uh, why hypercalcemia is taking place because the blood is taking a lot of calcium out of the bones, okay? And the calcium content in the blood is, keeps on increasing and the calcium content in the bones keeps on decreasing. So you get hypercalcemia and osteomalacia, softening of bones, okay? Calcium content is lost from the bones, you get osteomalacia, softening of bones. So nutritional problems of cancer therapy, surgical treatment. If you are undergoing surgery to get the cancer removed, okay, you have to wait through the healing process of the surgery. Specifically, if it is a gastrointestinal surgery, special problems of normal digestion, ingestion may take place. And if it is a, uh, if it is a smoking case and if it is a throat cancer, jaw cancer, tongue cancer, okay? A part of the mouth, jaw or tongue has to be removed. So definitely the patient will suffer a lot for with normal nutrition. Head and neck surgery or resections of in the oropharyngeal area, okay? These all are sometimes required to save the life of the patient, okay? And in turn, what you get is the food intake is greatly affected. Okay, the normal way how you can chew and swallow the food does not happen in these patients. So a lot of dumping syndrome is seen. Dumping syndrome means the, the food does not stay in the stomach for long. It automatically goes into the duodenum and it, uh, it uh, without getting properly digested, properly assimilated, it goes into the duodenum and the small intestine. That is dumping syndrome. In radiation, radiation therapy or radiotherapy, dysphagia, difficulty in swallowing, loss of taste, sensation, nausea, diarrhea, decrease in appetite. Okay, these are the th uh, these are the side effects of radiation therapy. Definitely, it will affect the nutrition of the patient as well. And abdominal radiation can also lead to damage of the healthy cells, not just the tumorous or cancerous cells, but also the healthy cells will also get damaged. Some amount of healthy cells always get damaged during radiation therapy. So that will also lead to further malabsorption. You are losing a lot of normal cells during every radiation section. Okay. And problems related to chemotherapy. Toxic, to, the toxic drugs uh, rapidly develop on the mucosal cells. So definitely you will have uh, nausea, vomiting. Ademia is also related to chemotherapy because again, chemotherapy does not allow absorption of nutrients from the intestine because of diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. So it leads to anemia. 
and general systemic toxicity is also there. Chemotherapy drugs are really, really toxic in nature. So definitely it will affect the overall physiology of the patient. So appetite, their uh, bone marrow, and even the uh, re regular mucosal cells in the intestine, they will also get affected by the toxicity. So on page number uh, 485, you have a table. With the help of this table, you can understand how to how to tackle different side effects and what you can do to elevate the condition. For example, no, nausea and vomiting. Okay, If the patient is suffering from nausea and vomiting, um, make sure that the patient uh, you keep the patient hydrated because continuous nausea and vomiting can put the patient through dehydration. So clear fluid, cold fluid, carbureted uh, 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 beverages. Okay, these, uh, these things you can give to the patient. You can add more polycos into it. Polycos is easily digested. It, it is not uh, specifically if the patient becomes glucose intolerant, polycos can work for, for them. Sipping the beverages through the straw slowly helps rather than drinking it or swallowing it. Uh, every meal should be very low in fat. Dry crackers or toast okay, is good. And if the patient is suffering from dry mouth, drink at least two liters of water or liquid in form of food or water juices on a daily basis. High calorie beverages are preferable than water. Okay, high calorie beverages like uh, cold drinks, okay, sweetened drinks, sport drinks, hypertonic drinks. Okay, they are high high calorie beverages. Hypertonic drinks specifically, sauces and gravies. Uh, and broth, okay. Broth is a good uh, option here. It adds protein as well and less fat. In certain, in, in severe cases, artificial saliva is given. Chewing gum can be given or sugar-free candy can be given to stimulate salivation. If the patient is suffering from taste altercation, experimenting with different flavors and different seasoning, try to change the seasoning on a daily basis and see what works for, for them. It's very subjective in nature. In loss of appetite, small frequent feed, uh, feed, uh, feed should be given. High calorie diet, high protein diet, but low fat. High calorie, high protein, but low fat. Sore mouth and thro throat, obviously give them non-acid food. Do not give them spicy food if they have sore mouth and throat. Sweet, blended, bland food is preferred here. In room temperature, don't give them too hot food. Swallowing food, if, if they have swallowing problem, liquid pureed food is given. Do not give them solid food for eating. Tube feeding can be preferred, NG tube feeding. Add more butter and sauces to the food. And make it more liquid so it is easily, it goes into the stomach easily. Finely chopped food. Early satiating, early satiating means they eat very little, few morsels of food and they become completely full. They can't eat anything more. So small frequent meals is given. Chew the food very well, eat slowly. Avoid food excessively high in fat. 30, to 30 minutes or half an hour or one hour before eating any meals, liquid or anything, uh, anything that is liquid in nature can be given. For vegetarians, you can go for sprouts, okay, pureed sprouts, finely chopped sprouts, okay. You can go for protein powders. Now coming to the nutritional requirement, energy. It, energy is subjective. It depends on how much uh, ca uh, calories is recommended to them based on their height, weight, etc. Uh, am I audible to all? Yeah. So energy requirement. Here it, it has been, they have shown just 2000 kilocalories, but it is very subjective. Okay. 
based on the BMI, based on the metabolic rate of the patient, this can change. Protein, 80 to 100 gram of protein. You can see the protein intake is much higher, more than a normal adult, a sedentary a healthy adult, because protein, high protein diet is prescribed here. Micronutrients, you have to give them supplements because the intestine is already undergoing malabsorption. Okay, you cannot trust the intestine when you are dealing with a cancer patient, specifically when they are undergoing chemotherapy, radiation therapy, or surgery. You do not trust the small intestine to do its job of absorption. Okay, some degree of malabsorption will always be there. So it's better to go for supplements, multivitamin supplements and mineral supplements. Fluid, minimum two liters is recommended and avoid dehydration. Dietary management with uh, when it comes to the side effects. This we have discussed just now, dietary management. Table 21.3, nausea, vomiting, dry mouth, taste alteration, loss of appetite, sore mouth, throat, swallowing problems, early satiety. With this we have discussed just now. It's on page number 485, table 21.3. It's the same table you have to learn. Whole grains can be included in the diet and uh, processed foods, food, refined food should be avoided for cancer patients. Five to nine servings of colored vegetables and fruits should be given. It has high phytochemicals that can fight cancer. Legumes such as soya bean should be consumed. Red meat avoided and avoid too much of omega-6 fatty acids. Milk can be included, not the full fat milk, toned milk, sufficient can be included. Refined sugar, avoid refined sugar. Stevia can be used. Okay. Total fat intake should be restricted, not more than 20 gram of fat. Trans fat completely avoided. Fish, nuts, avocados, flax seeds, olive oils can be taken. Plenty of water, at least three cups of tea can be included. It provides antioxidant. Green tea or black tea, not the milk tea. More number of meals to be included to meet the increased requirements of calories and protein. So frequent and small meals as much as possible. Five to six meals, small frequent meals. Fish can be included in diet. Fish is a good source of protein and healthy source of protein. MCT oil you can use. You can so you can use coconut oil here as well. Nutritional supplements, commercially available supplements are useful. Just if you are in if you are in India, just make sure FSSAI uh, uh, accredited certis, uh, or certified supplements are used. Okay. Uh, it uh, supplements are not supposed to substitute food they are just supposed to add on more nutrition to the existing food okay do not sub uh, uh, substitute supplements with food whey protein can be added this is for vegetarians somebody has asked the question for vegetarians so add whey protein into the diet to prevent clinical malnutrition and prevent cancer patients from dying due to malnutrition whey protein is important And these mushrooms, the one you see on the top, this is our regular button mushroom. Okay. Sorry. This one is the regular button mushroom, uh, button mushroom. This, which looks something like a brain, it is the meteke mushroom. And the brown, the rust brown one, this is the reishi mushroom. So these mushrooms boost immunity and they also prevent or they are used in treating certain symptoms of cancer. We do not know if they cure cancer. We cannot claim that. But these mushrooms are good supplements, good nutritional supplements for people who have a risk of developing cancer okay, or who are undergoing certain treatment of cancer. They are immunostimulant. So they improve your immunity. They are anti-inflammatory in nature. 
and they also act as anti-tumor because they may have tumor suppressing agents within them. White butter mushroom is readily available everywhere in India. In any market you go, white mushrooms are uh, abundant. So it has phytochemicals that can block the activity of certain enzyme that can decrease the production of estrogen. Okay, so which in turn, which can prevent the breast cancer, uh, cancer cell development. That's how button mushrooms can help. So nutrition supplements are important, specifically when, give me a moment, one minute. So nutrition supplements, they come in variety forms and flavors. It can be used in different ways based on the requirement of the subject. Okay, So when the patient is completely unable to eat because of dysphagia or because of surgery or of pharyngeal blockages, etc. So in that case, along with tube feedings, you can give nutrition supplements as well. Okay, Specifically, when you know the patient is undergoing malabsorption, these nutrition supplements come in, uh, they are handy to use. So prevention, cancer preventing food, vitamins like A, E, K, okay, that all all the all the food which are good in antioxidant, great in antioxidant effect. Okay, no regular people can also take these mushrooms. All the food that are great antioxidant, great source of antioxidants. Okay, that means it should be rich in vitamin E, C, K minerals like selenium, rich in carotenoids like beta-carotenoid, lutein, lycopene, and phytochemicals like flavonoids, rich food. They all are good food, uh, preventive sources for cancer. Terpenes, they are also a class of uh, carotenoids, which are present in tomatoes, parsley, oranges, and spinach. Okay, They are good antioxidants. They also inhibit uh, tumor growth. Lycopene, which is mentioned here, it's again another carotenoid form, formed, in toma formed in tomatoes. Powerful antioxidant again. Reduces the risk of posted can cancer development. Lutein, another carotenoid. Uh, uh, Zizantine and lutein, they are, they are different forms of carotenoids. Reduces the risk of lung cancer and breast cancer. All the flavonoids, Phenols are present in grapes, specifically red grapes, okay? Rich in antioxidants, apples, chocolates, okay? And tea also have phenols, flavonoids. They are able to uh, scavenge all the free radicals and they can take away the mu uh, mutagens and carcinogens. Cherry tomatoes have more fla uh, flavonoids as compared to your regular tomatoes. Peanuts also are rich in flavonoids. Grains, whole grains are rich in uh, phenolic compounds like ferulic acid, caffeine, caffeic acid. So they are cancer inhibitors. So giving whole grains to the cancer patient is ideal. Lignans, which is found in flax seed, wheat, bran, barley. They, are, they, are, they have phytoestrogens that can prevent certain forms of breast cancer. Phytic acid as well. Phytic acid chelates. These are the phytochemicals and their sources. All these phytochemicals and all these sources are rich in antioxidant effect.
it's not about the color color basically comes from carotenoids okay carotenoids are the ones that give this distinct color carotenoids are the antioxidants that give this distinct color to the fruits and vegetables apart from that it's not necessary that all the phytochemicals are related with colors beta carotene that's a phytochemical that is definitely is related with color you can take a screenshot of this different forms of phytochemicals and their best sources Prebiotics and probiotics. So prebiotics are the food that you give for the bacteria which is there in your gut. Okay. So it increases the bacteria in the gut. So for example, even if you have an antibiotic, your antibiotic is cap capable of killing the probiotic good bacteria which is present in your gut. Okay. Antibiotics can have that. Okay, so whenever you come out of an antibiotic treatment, you fell ill, it was bacterial infection or anything. After you come out of the antibiotics, you definitely have to put more prebiotics as well as probiotics in your diet to bring back that good bacteria, to bring back the gut bacteria. Okay, so prebiotics is the food that you give for your bacteria so that they grow in a restricted manner, but they grow in your stomach. They, they give health to your stomach okay so asparagus wheat bran garlic bananas okay asparagus is not commonly found in indian markets if you're, if you are living in a metro city you may you may find that asparagus but usually it is not used in indian cuisine okay but beet wheat bran like when you are uh, when you get your atta from your uh, local vendors okay you don't uh, you don't sieve it okay Use the bran as well. Even if you're saving it, use uh, uh, use the leftover bran back, put it back into the atta and then use it. Okay, wheat bran is a good prebiotic. Bananas are good prebiotic. Garlic as well. Probiotic is you are already having good bacteria as it is into your food. Okay, so yogurt has a lot of lactobacilli. Probiotic milk like yakut and all. Sour cream also has lactobacilli, kefir. Okay, these all are dairy products which are a great source of lactobacilli. Okay, you can make um, kimchi at home as well. Kimchi, or you can use pickled vegetables, not the uh, not the uh, spicy ones. Okay, just pickle few vegetables with vinegar, sugar. Okay, and some spices, whole spices. Okay, and use it within a week or so. That is also a good source of uh, probiotics okay so probiotics they support your intestinal health and they will they will do not allow they will not allow the bad bacteria or the toxic bacteria to overgrow okay they can fight the bad, toxic bacteria and they will keep your intestine healthy so lactobacillus bifidobacteria okay they all produce this organic acid that reduce the intestinal pH and they will, uh, because the intestinal pH should be acidic in nature, the growth of pathogenic bacteria will not take place. So this is how probiotics help in keeping your intestine healthy. Resistant starches as well. Okay, there is a correlation between high intake of resistant starch and the lower risk of colorectal cancer. Specifically, if colorectal ca colon cancer runs in your family, invest more in eating resistant starch-based food like beans, brown rice, green bananas, more lentils, dal, okay, muesli, oats, potatoes, 
in your diet. So these are resistant starches, good source of fiber. Okay. Resistant starch, in the name itself, you have the meaning. Starch is carbohydrate. Resistant starch are carbohydrates they do, that can resist your acids and enzymes in the digestion. Okay, it will not allow easy digestion. So it acts like a fiber. It acts like a dietary fiber. They do, they do not break down easily. Really. Dietary fiber, it protects against colon cancer, prevents gastrointestinal diseases. It can control high cholesterol also, reduces inflammation, aids in weight loss, treats piles. Okay. So the fiber, in, in respect to cancer, fiber can dilute the bile acid and thus preventing the mutation of cell proliferation within the intestine. Dietary fiber undergoes fermentation because it is not digested. So it stays in the intestine for a longer period of time and it undergoes fermentation. And it lowers what, whatever is fermented, it is acidic in nature. Okay. So whatever is fermented, if it, is, it stays in your intestine for a longer period of time, it makes the intestine acidic in nature. And thus, it will not allow bad bacteria and mutation to happen in the intestine. So these are the Methods in which dietary fiber will prevent colon cancer. Specifically, by keeping the intestine acidic in nature, making sure that the intestine is moving, okay, there is no constipation, intestine is moving, the peristalsis movement is taking place on a regular basis. Now, regarding insulin resistance, obesity, insulin resistance, and how it leads to cancer. So, high food intake, okay, high calorie intake and high calorie output, okay. So, low calorie output and high calorie intake will lead to obesity, okay. Obesity will lead to insulin resistance. What is insulin resistance? Body is making insulin, pancreas is making, uh, like they are making insulin, insulin, but your cells are not responding to insulin. Your cells are resisting insulin and they do not take up of, of glucose at all. Okay, only when the cells respond to insulin, insulin will make a pathway for the glucose to enter into the cells. The cells can use this glucose for energy later on. So in insulin resistance, cells do not respond to insulin. They will not take up glucose. Glucose will be in the blood, keeping the blood glucose level high. It again leads to hyperglycemia, high blood glucose levels. High blood glucose levels will lead to hyperinsulinemia. Okay, So when the glucose level in the blood is increasing, it is not going down, more and more insulin will also be secreted. Pancreas will only re re react to the blood glucose levels. Okay, So pancreas are getting the reaction that blood glucose levels are not coming down so what it will do it will secrete more insulin into the blood so on one side you are getting hyperglycemic the other side you are getting more insulin also insulin into the blood okay so these uh, these will lead uh, into a chain reaction okay that will create more cell proliferation cell proliferation means what cell will break down and differentiate and increase in number Okay, the IGFBP, IGF the factors, okay, these are not important. These factors are not important. These are more, more scientific in nature. Just have to understand, if you stay hyperglycemic in nature, if your blood glucose levels stay higher, okay, what will happen? More cells are formed. Why? Reason being, the existing cells, the existing cells that you have, they are not responding to the they are not responding to insulin they are not responding to glucose what can be done next the existing cells will undergo proliferation new cells will be formed so that at least they can take up the glucose this is your body trying to bring down the glucose level bring down the insulin level by creating more cells okay if you have more cells uh, more, more there is more space for the blood glucose uh, glucose level to enter into the cell and it can come down this is what the body thinks 
Okay, so more cell proliferation is taking place. What is cancer? Abnormal cell proliferation is cancer. So this is how obesity or insulin resistance can lead to cancer. Okay, is it clear to all? Is it clear to all how obesity is related to cancer? Basically, your, your body is making more cells so, so that it can tackle the high blood glucose levels. But in a way, in the opposite way, it is creating cancer. It is creating tumor. More abnormal cells means it's tumor, it's cancer. Okay. 